Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, today we are presenting Miles Primer's talk on Lagrangian neural networks. My name is Noor Fahmi and I'm data scientist at Hashtag Paid. Um, and this talk is being hosted by Ayurvedic Intellect. If you don't know who we are, we are an ML depository um, and you can reach us at ai.science.com. Um, so without further ado, um, Miles, start us off. Thanks. So my name is Miles Kramer. I'm a grad student at Princeton. Um, in this work, we, we show you how to um, learn Lagrangians, which is a type of energy, from with a neural network from uh, dynamical data. So this is work with uh, Sam, Stefan, uh, Peter, David, Shirley. Um, and you can see our paper at that URL. So just to give an overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give uh, you some physics background if you maybe don't really remember these concepts um, or you're new to them. Then I'll talk about the link between neural networks and physics. Then I'll talk about uh, Sam's work in Hamiltonian neural networks and then our new work in Lagrangian neural networks. And also at the end, I'll talk about um, this other type of approach uh, called a Lagrangian graph network. So uh, if you can think way back to um, when you did physics or if you're, you're comfortable with this kind of thing, uh, the first approach to classical mechanics, which is the dynamics of, of you know, like everyday objects moving around, falling, um, is forces. So this is Newtonian mechanics. So um, objects and fields induce forces on other objects and you uh, you have this this force. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you see these uh, forces, you sum them into a net force that gives you the acceleration of an object. Um, this is Newtonian mechanics. Um, so there's there's common forces like gravity pulling things down. It's it's a force vector, and you sum them up and that gives you acceleration. So the other way of doing this. Um, which you learn about in a physics undergrad, if you, if you do that, um, is called Lagrangian mechanics. So in this setting, instead of dealing with forces, now we deal with energies. So an energy is a, it's a scalar quantity, so it's a, it's a single number that describes the energy content of your system. So like if you look on the side of a cereal box, it tells you the calories um, so that is the, the potential energy, the chemical potential energy in the cereal. Um, that's a type of energy. Temperature is a type of energy in like a fluid or a gas. Um, these are types of energies. Now, Lagrangian mechanics says that if you have a coordinate system, so this is like positions of particles or, or other dynamical quantities in your system, um, so a coordinate system as a function of time, so these are like, the Q is always position, like a coordinate. If you write down the kinetic energy of the system, so uh, if you remember, this is half times the mass times the, the speed squared. So that's the kinetic energy of a particle. So if you write that down, you also write down the potential energy. So in, that's like mass times gravity times height for, uh, falling objects. So you write down kinetic potential. The Lagrangian is um, the subtraction of the kinetic minus the potential energy. So you take this quantity and then you write down the integral of the Lagrangian uh, as a function of position velocity over time. So th this is called the action. So this is the, uh, it's a uh, Lagrangian times time and you integrate it. So it's an intuitive way to think about this. Um, the energy state at the very beginning of your state to the amount of energy that you have at the end state. So, uh, so it's not the total energy. So the total energy is T plus V, but the Lagrangian is T minus V. Um, so it's a, that's like a key difference of the action. Um, and so it's the integral of that quantity over time. It's just, it's called the action. And so if you start at 
position Q, Q0, T0. So it's like a position and a time. And then you say that uh, then I finish at Q1 at time T1. So mm -hmm. I start with this position and velocity at this time, and I finish with this position and velocity at this time. The universe oh. is a fundamental, sorry? Oh, sorry, I just said, okay. okay. So a fundamental uh, rule of the universe, and this is used even in modern physics, this is like, I think it's like the most fundamental thing, um, is the principle of stationary action. So what this says is the path the universe takes through a dynamical system is such that the action is, uh, it's an extremum point. So if you vary the path a little bit, the action uh, should be the same. So it's an extremum of the, it doesn't have to be uh, the minima or the max, it could be either minima or maxima, um, but it's a extreme point of the action. So the universe always takes the path that extremizes the integral of the Lagrangian over time. Mm -hmm. So, what you usually do is you take that equation, uh, delta s equals zero, and you expand the derivatives in that, and that gives you these equations called the Euler-Lagrange equations. This is the energy equivalent of uh, Newton's force law, f equals ma. Um, so now you have, you write down in, uh, the Lagrangian, t minus v, and then you take this derivative, a partial derivative with respect to velocity, partial derivative with respect to position, time derivative on, on that side, and that gives you the dynamics of the system uh, as a, an ODE. So as an example, in a falling ball, half times mass times speed squared minus mass times gravity times height, you plug it in this equation and it gives you uh, the, the x acceleration is zero. So if you throw a ball and there's no air resistance, it'll just go forever in the x direction. But the mm -hmm. y direction, it's going to fall at a constant uh, acceleration. And that's just, uh, it's a 9.8 meters per second squared. So you, uh, this is the differential equation to describe the dynamics, and you numerically integrate these to give you the dynamics of the system over time. So you can also talk about the transform of this, so it's called the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian. It's the Hamiltonian. And this is, it's usually equal to the total energy of the system. So it's just T plus V. And the Hamiltonian you write in terms of the momenta of the system. So now you have position and the momenta of uh, coordinates in your system. So the way Hamiltonian mechanics works is you take the path through your dynamical system that preserves the energy, preserves H. So you basically, you move perpendicular to the gradient of, it, of H. So as an example, for a falling ball, you have the X momenta, mass times the X velocity, X uh, speed, and then the mass times the Y speed is the Y momenta. So you write down your, your Hamiltonian, which is the total energy, um, and that gives you the dynamics of the ball. So if you have your Hamiltonian, you write it down in terms of momenta, position, then you get the velocity is equal to this, and the momenta is equal to this. <clears throat> so again, this is kind of like another way of writing uh, Newton's equations, F equals MA. So these are called Hamilton's equations. It's a, it's a very nice first order explicit differential equation to give you the physical dynamics of the system. So some things we didn't talk about, I guess I mentioned is uh, things like air resistance, friction, um, these kind of things are, uh, I mean, <laughs> like physicists, if you take a physics education, you don't, you pretend uh, you live in this imaginary world where friction doesn't exist, but it does. So engineers do this, um, you, you add a force, on this side of the Euler-Lagrange equation, and that, that gives you uh, friction terms. Um, you can also deal with, with uh, constraints, use Lagrangian multiplier method, like if, you're, if your ball's moving on a surface or something. 
Um, so once you have these differential equations, like the you know what the acceleration is, you know what the velocity is as a function, um, then you can put it through a numeric integrator. So you have this differential equation, um, and then you can use several methods to numerically integrate it. So if you have like, you know the, the y derivative as a function of y and x and t, you can, uh, this is like the Euler integrator, you just, you take steps, and every step you just add the velocity to the position times the next. So velocity times the time step gives you the next position. So that's like the simplest integrator. It's called an Euler integrator. Um, there's more accurate ones. So you can you can do like an, a rung kata, which is higher order. Um, and then, so these can be very accurate, but they may not preserve like known variants, like, like energy maybe. Um, you can also do something called a symplectic integrator, and these give you exact energy conservation, but uh, they might not be very accurate. So um, these are different types of integrators. Once you have that differential equation, uh, you can get that dynamics. So this is an example of a run cut of fourth order. You take the, uh, so basically if you want to find the next step, you add your current step plus this, this thing, which is like, uh, you take little steps and get the velocity, and you, it's basically like uh, it's basically like fitting a curve between the points. This is the symplectic integrator, different approach. This exactly conserves energy, um, but it uh, might not be very accurate. So now let's change to machine learning. So machine learning is this type of parameter estimation or model building where your parameters lack an explicit uh, physical meaning. So there's there's many types of ML, like, like supervised is what I'm gonna talk about today. So that's like if you have uh, many X, Y tuples and you wanna build a model that uh, interpolates that surface. So like linear regression, where you're fitting a line of best fit, that's one example of machine learning. A neural network is a, these are, usually use ReLU activations. So it's, it's literally piecewise linear regression. So it's linear regression in this high dimensional space. You uh, predict a vector given a vector. It's, it's little pieces of linear regression in a high dimensional space. And in this particular scenario for this paper, yeah. what are we inputting and what are we outputting? Uh, so I think I'm gonna, Maybe I'll clear that up in a couple slides, and I'll ask you then. So, so it's piecewise linear regression. Um, and then, so there's other activations like, like Tanch Soft Plus, you kind of smear that linearity out, um, but a relative keeps that linearity. So, so basically, neural networks are really good at learning an arbitrary function uh, to go from one vector to a different vector which might be a different dimension. Now, a lot of neural network research is pretty much about getting them to cheat less. Neural networks are very good at cheating. Like they just memorize your data set, they overfit. Um, so a lot of these, these techniques are just about um, how do we get the neural network to cheat less? So data augmentation is probably the most important one. Um, you basically, you just generate more data so the neural network can't just memorize the answers. Now it has to actually learn the, the surface. You know, regularization is another one. So kind of enforcing the neural network has to be a certain level of smoothness. So it can't just jump between the answers. There's also these, these structures you can add to them. So like convolutional neural network is a way of weight sharing for images. Graph networks is a way of weight sharing uh, over edges. There's different structures that you can you can add to neural networks so they, they don't cheat as much. So the way you, you optimize a neural network is via its derivative, because they have so many parameters, you've got to use the derivative. Um, the derivative is it's well defined, it's just a product of sparse matrices. Um, and so you compute this derivative and you you basically step down the gradient of your parameters. So I guess I I don't need to get into this too much. 
So here, what I'm interested in is, is physical systems. So, you know, many other things can be reframed as dynamics problems. And I'll, I'm just gonna talk about this. So we are interested in problems where we are given a sequence of uh, positions and velocities of particles over time. So you know that the particle is here and it's moving that way at this time step, and then the next time step, it's here and it's moving that way. So we have maybe I particles over time or I coordinates over time. We have the positions velocities. How do we use a neural network to learn to recreate these dynamics or learn to simulate this system? So as an example, and I, I hope this answers your question, is say we want to predict the dynamics of a pendulum. So, uh, so this is kind of like the baseline example of a neural network, is you take the, the number of dynamical parameters, so dynamical parameters, something that changes, like position or velocity change, and the number of fixed parameters, like the mass or like the length of the pendulum. Um, so you take those as input to the neural network, and that's a vector, and it maps to another vector, which is the, it's either the update to the position of velocity, or it's just the next position of velocity. Um, so in the example of a pendulum, you learn a, a function that goes from theta, theta velocity, gravity, and the length of the pendulum to the, uh, maybe the theta acceleration or maybe the, the theta step two and theta velocity step two. Um, but you really, uh, it's easier to predict the kind of like the, the change in parameters rather than just the next parameter. So this is like the connection between neural networks and differential equations. So the, the real world application of um, neural networks in physics is, is kind of what I'm interested in. So if you have some, some massive simulation that takes 30 million CPU hours, um, neural networks, if you, if you train the neural network to simulate that system, they, uh, they find patterns that the scientists might not see, and they kind of learn the effective rules in the simulation. So maybe in a particle simulation, you have every particle talking to each other, and the neural network looks at it and it says, oh, uh, these particles are just talking to their neighbors, so I don't, need to, I don't need to look at the other ones. I'll just do these and then these. Um, these neural networks, they learn effective rules in those simulations um, so they can be actually more accurate in simulating at reduced computational cost. So this is a big application of neural networks for physics. So my advisor, uh, Shirley Ho, has this UNET which is traditionally computer vision, um, she uses a, a unit to do these massive cosmological simulations faster. Um, I think it's like, it's like 10 million times faster than a standard simulator. Um, Peter Bataglia is a, a good collaborator of mine. Um, he's also on this paper. Um, so he has this uh, interaction network used in many applications, you know, uh, drug discovery, molecular modeling are starting to use this a lot. Discovering new drugs, you want uh, you want fast simulators so you can simulate um, the the particles moving around. There's this recent IPAM workshop um, that has a good list of these applications. So I read this paper uh, when it first came out, and Sam had this really good blog on it. And this is what got me interested in the first place. So he introduced this idea where the, the neural network, basically instead of predicting the next time step, now the neural network predicts the energy of the system. And then you use Hamilton's equations to give you the dynamics of the system. So this is his originally, original paper, really nice paper. And so, so you learn a mapping from your Position, momenta, non-dynamical coordinates, like length of a pendulum, uh, to an energy. So it just has to predict a single value. And then since neural networks are differentiable, you can just take derivatives 
of the neural network, um, and that gives you the dynamics. So you, yeah. Oh, I just said that's really interesting. Yeah. So you take the derivatives of the neural network, and you can use Hamilton's equations. It just gives you the dynamics for free. Um, and then you, you compare the derivative, which is the velocity derivative position is momenta, update momenta velocity. Um, so you compare that, and then you just optimize that. So now you're training the second order derivative of the neural network. So this is a schematic. The baseline neural network goes from position momenta to the velocity and momenta derivative. The Hamiltonian neural network goes from position momenta to a single number, the Hamiltonian. Then you, you use backprop. So you just take the derivative of the neural network. You go back down. Derivative of position is momenta derivative. Derivative of momenta is the velocity. Um, so this is a, it's a really cool way of just changing the problem um, into this, this alternate technique. So why do we want to do this? So it turns out this actually works um, a lot better for physics because you're introducing a new symmetry. So the universe is symmetric in time. And what that means is uh, energy is conserved over time. The total energy of the universe is the, the same today as it was originally, once you include you know, all the different types of energy in the universe. So this is also true in a lot of physics simulators. Even if there's, even if there's friction, you're still recording things like the heat. Um, so energy is, is almost always conserved in a lot of these simulators. And Hamiltonian neural networks and Lagrangian neural networks are a way of explicitly putting the symmetry into the, the neural network. <clears throat> so in this case, you train on the same data. Um, the, I guess they probably use the same uh, training procedure. And you can see that the mean squared error is just better over time. So this is a regular neural network, and you see it, it actually decays over time. But the Hamiltonian neural network, because you fix that symmetry in it, um, the energy is conserved. So now you've embedded this other symmetry into the neural network. So why does this work? So you're so again, you're training the second order derivative of the neural network. So basically, you have if you randomly initialize a neural network that predicts a single number from like position uh, and momenta, it looks like this. So if this is like, this is the energy predicted by the neural network, it's just random at the start of training. And you take the, the gradients, then the neural network says, okay, if you're a particle at this position, this momenta, go that way. So it starts off with this kind of random surface. And over the course of training, this warps into this final surface, um, where if you're at this position, this momenta go that way, um, and you can see that um, this is the final dynamics learned by the network. So now let's talk about the Lagrangian. So this is the, the new contribu contribution of this paper. Um, this started, I think, uh, I guess in November of the year, that year, um, and Peter Battaglia, a good collaborator of mine, just, just, we were just talking about it. Um, you know, uh, there's a Hamiltonian neural network. Um, can, we, can we make a Lagrangian neural network? Is it, is it possible? Can you learn a Lagrangian from data? Because the, the actual equation for Lagrangian dynamics is uh, different. It's not explicit. It's not first order. Um, can you actually do this? So. These are some differences between Hamiltonians and Lagrangians. Hamiltonian, uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy. Lagrangian, kinetic minus potential. And a very important point is the input to a Hamiltonian. This is, this, uh, it really needs to be emphasized. The coordinates as input have to be this way. The Hamiltonian, you have to put in the position and what's called the canonical momenta for the system. 
the Lagrangian, you just put in the position and the time derivative of the position. But this canonical momenta is, um, it, has, it has a very specific uh, form. It basically, it has to be the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity. And it turns out that besides simple particle systems where it's just mass times velocity, in more general cases, it can be nonlinear, it can be non-local. So in general relativity, the canonical momenta actually requires an integral over everything. So it can be uh, very non-local. So this is very problematic. You, you pretty much, if you see an unknown system, you need to know beforehand a lot of things about those dynamics so you can actually write down the momenta. But Lagrangians, you just need to know what are the dynamical coordinates and how do they change over time. So you don't need any prior knowledge about the physics in the system. The problem with Lagrangians is, so the Hamiltonian gives you these explicit derivatives, right? But the Lagrangian, it's kind of this mess of a ODE. So you look at this, okay, how do we actually stick a neural network in there? So this is our forward model. You start off with the Euler-Lagrange equation. You take the time derivative of this expression and uh, derivative of Lagrangian with respect to position. So we first vectorize it. So now instead of um, this index j, we, we use this, uh, this vector uh, a nabla, so this is like a vector of derivatives with respect to every uh, velocity coordinate and position coordinate. So these are just vector forms of this. Um, so you can think of these as like vectors themselves. It's a vector of operators. So now what we do is we do a chain rule. So you take the derivative with respect to velocity and you, you basically expand it. So you do uh, del by del q dot, and now it's uh, del by del um, q dot, and then you have a time derivative on the q dot. So this becomes this, and that's just uh, calculus. And so you have these, uh, this matrix multiplication there. Um, so it's like a Hessian. Um, and then what you do is you organize it so that this acceleration is on the left side, and then you invert this, this part right here. You invert that, it's a, it's a Hessian matrix, um, and that gives you this expression. So we first, we first wrote this down, and I really didn't know if it would work, and, um, but it did, and it was, it was really surprising that this worked. Um, and this is our new model. So you, you observe the dynamics of a system over time, like the position velocity, the baseline approach, you take the position velocity and you predict the acceleration of the dynamics. The Lagrangian approach, much like the Hamiltonian, you predict a scalar. So you take the position velocity, it doesn't need to be a momenta, that's the key thing. You take the velocity, uh, you predict the Lagrangian, and then you take the uh, gradients with respect to the input. And in this case, you actually have to take the second order gradient. Um, so we use, uh, we use JAX for this, and there's also a PyTorch implementation now because they added the, they added the Hessian operation. But originally we wrote this in JAX, um, which is good for higher to order derivatives. And so you, you get the, the higher order gradients, and that gives you the acceleration over time. So now you put in position velocity, and you get the acceleration in this way rather than just at the output. And what this does for you is the same thing as the Hamiltonian neural network. It uh, explicitly encodes time symmetry or energy conservation uh, into the neural network. So you can see that the regular neural network, um, it loses energy over time. Even though the training set doesn't have that, the regular neural network just seems to, uh, it doesn't really worry about these these fundamental symmetries. But the Lagrangian neural network, you embed it into the model, um, so it's explicitly conserving energy over time. So there's some related work. So uh, 
so the deep Lagrangian network is another way of doing this. Um, the difference in their approach is they assume, um, much like the Hamiltonian network, they assume that you know um, the canonical momenta beforehand. So they assume that the kinetic energy is the square of the velocity. Um, but our approach is, is you basically, because you write it in this way, you don't assume anything about the energy of the system. So you, there's no prior on the dynamics. It can learn um, arbitrary Lagrangians. Um, but their, their work is cool and they also have, uh, they also deal with friction, um, which is interesting. And ours is um, for very arbitrary physics. So this is an example if you have a baseline neural network, Lagrangian neural network, train the same system for the same uh, training parameters, and then you evaluate it. And you can see that, okay, they both look they both look realistic. It's a chaotic system, so they look different, but over the course of time, um, you can see that the, uh, the baseline neural network, it starts to enter this, this low energy state. So over time, the Lagrangian neural network keeps the same energy, but the baseline, uh, it has decayed a bit. And now it's in this low energy state for no reason, because that's not in our training set. It's just, it doesn't really care about energy conservation. The Lagrangian neural network, you embed this. So now to compare Hamiltonian neural networks and Lagrangian neural networks, um, again, the Hamiltonian neural network assumes that you know momenta. This is fine if you have simple particle systems where the momenta is just mass times velocity, but you know many systems don't have this simple property, like magnetic fields. If you have a charged particle in a magnetic field, uh, the canonical momenta actually has the magnetic field in the momenta. Um, special relativity, where the max velocity is uh, C. So in this example, I just set C to be one, and the Lagrangian uh, looks like this. This is like this is like uh, velocity squared. Um, this is what velocity squared looks like in relativity, um, and you see that the canonical momenta looks like this. So it's velocity divided by one minus velocity squared to the power of three over two. That's complicated. If you don't know that physics beforehand, um, you're, you're basically screwed if you use a Hamiltonian neural network because, so we, we tried this. You put in position and what you hope to be the momenta. Um, you try to learn it. And the Hamiltonian neural network just settles to this minima that's, uh, it's not good at all, really. It, it learns this, um, it just learns like a constant solution. Now, if you give the Hamiltonian neural network the true momenta, so you feed it this complicated expression, um, and then you have to map back, you have to invert it afterwards, um, then you can actually learn it with a Hamiltonian neural network. But the Lagrangian neural network, all you need is the velocity. So you give the, the position velocity, you notice there's no, there's no complicated physics in this. You don't need to know a prior about the dynamics. You feed it position velocity, um, and it learns the output accurately. So despite the Lagrangian having this complicated form, um, it actually learns uh, the true dynamics without knowing the momenta, and it learns the energy conservation. So yeah, I mean, we were, we were really surprised this worked at all. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's exciting that it works. So we also do this other thing um, with graph networks. So a graph network is a way of uh, learning to model properties about a graph. So a, a graph is like uh, many particles and their edges between the particles. So the advantage of a graph network is it doesn't matter how many particles there are in your training set versus your validation set or your deployment set. It will be the same model for each. So it's kind of like, a convolutional neural network, but for particle systems. Um, so we extend the Lagrangian neural network to graphs. And the way of doing it is 
you basically sum. So energy, energy is just something you sum over a system. Um, if a particle over there has some energy and a particle there has some energy, you sum the, the energy of both of those, and that's the total energy of your system. Um, so in a graph network, you calculate the Lagrangian at every node in the graph, and the Lagrangian, uh, the Lagrangian density is what we call it at the position of each node, is a function of the, the nodes correct, connected around it. Um, you basically, you sum these up, and it gives you a total energy of the graph, so a total Lagrangian of the graph. Um, and then you just plug it into the same forward model, except now your coordinates are of the graph. It's of every single uh, dynamical coordinate of the graph. So you plug it into the forward model, um, and that gives you the dynamics of the graph. And so this is the wave equation. And here we have 100 nodes in the graph, and every node in the graph is connected to its neighbor. Now, to calculate the Lagrangian of the system, you basically you calculate the Lagrangian at every point, and you sum it. Uh, you just you sum it over the graph, over this this uh, this string, um, and then you plug it in the forward model. And so you can see it it learns the dynamics pretty well. This is on not much training actually, but it still learns it pretty well. And you can see that the integrated energy across the string is conserved, um, which is which is pretty cool. So the the energy over the graph is conserved just by summing a Lagrangian over it and then passing it through the forward model. So this is a Lagrangian graph network. Um, now, another advantage of the, the energy approach is you get very good interpretability because the output of your model is just a single number. And um, so it's a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian um, and it's, it's very interpretable. So basically in this other paper that I wrote um, where we, we convert a, a deep neural network into a symbolic equation, um, we do an example with Hamiltonian models. Now, this approach is also applicable to Lagrangian models. You can learn, so basically, if you train this Lagrangian neural network on a graph or even a regular system, um, you can apply symbolic regression and get out a symbolic form of the Lagrangian um, for your system. So it's a very interpretable way of learning the dynamics of a system. Um, so that's... Uh, my talk. Are there any questions? Yeah, there's a couple from the audience. Okay. Cool. Um, so Ptac is asking if um, a Lagrangian neural network can be extended for coupled systems, such as in real-world turbulence models. Such as uh, what? Um, real-world turbulence models. What turbulence model? Yes. Yeah, so, so for this. I would use the, the graph net. And basically, what you would do, so if, if your turbulence model is, um, maybe it's like a 2D grid, what you, you, can, you can basically apply a graph network to a grid. So they, people have applied graph networks to, to like pixeled images before. So you can apply the Lagrangian graph network to a grid by basically every uh, grid point in your turbulence simulation is a node in the graph. And every pixel, which is a node, uh, is connected to every pixel around it. So in this example, um, every uh, point on that wave is connected to the immediate neighbors. Um, so in a, in a turbulence simulation, if it's 2D, it would be connected to every node around it. Um, so eight, so eight, eight nodes. And basically, you would calculate a Lagrangian density of the center node, comma, the eight other node features. Um, and then you sum this over the graph, and then you pass it through this model. And that would give you uh, the dynamics of your uh, fluid, and it would conserve energy. So, so if you have friction, you would probably want to also include uh, dynamical properties like heat. And then the energy is actually conserved, because 
um, because the total energy when you include heat um, is conserved. Cool. PTAC also has a follow-up question. Um, using the graph approach would cause scaling issues besides turbulence is primarily a 3D phenomenon. Oh, yeah. So, so in 3D, you would just have uh, 3D grids. And so like a node um, would connect to all uh, 26 nodes around it. Um, so yeah, so a higher number of nodes isn't isn't that big of a problem. So in this paper, we have like some nodes are connected to like a thousand other nodes. Um, so in this example, uh, 27 nodes uh, isn't a big deal, and you would just pass that through the Lagrangian model and then sum it over your model. Cool. Um, a question that I had is if CNNs can learn to become rotationally invariant using augmentation methods, um, was that ever a method that you had used for a Lagrangian neural network, given that you're also trying to learn some kind of symmetry? Ah, so, um, so this is like another type of symmetry. So rotationally invariant um, CNNs is, is one type of invariance. Uh, this is invariant to, to basically changes in time or energy. So it conserves energy. Um, so it's like a, it's a time symmetry, and then you have a rotational symmetry for, I guess, like gauge CNNs. Yeah. Um, another thing you can do is, um, uh, so if you have a Lagrangian graph network, you can enforce, you can also enforce rotational invariance. Um, there's a paper out of Andrew Wilson's group uh, to do this for arbitrary lead groups. But another thing you can do is if you pass in the dis displacement, or you, sorry, you pass in the distance between nodes um, when you're in your graph network, you only pass the distance between nodes um, mm -hmm. because rotation will not affect the input to the Lagrangian, you're actually rotationally invariant. So by putting in distance instead of displacement, which is a full 3D vector, by putting in distance, um, you're not only translational in invariant, but you're also rotationally invariant. Just by, if you put in distance instead of displacement into the Lagrangian. Very cool. You do it for arbitrary uh, Lie groups with uh, Andrew Wilson's group's work. So I guess that would have more implications in quantum, since we're talking about these groups. For uh, rotational invariance? Yeah, yeah, and we Yeah, and uh, so another thing, so we didn't do it in this paper, but um, in cosmology, uh, rotational invariance is, is often implied, so you could do it here too. You feed in maybe only the, the displacement, um, only the distance between nodes. Very cool. Um, hold on. So Amir is asking if um, you can comment on the generalizability of this approach um, in the sense that would these simulations suffer from the usual issues that neural networks have? Uh, what's the, the iter iter iteralizability? Uh, generalizability. Oh, generalizability. Yeah. Um, so, so um, is he asking about regular neural networks? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think it's often seen in um, in many different models when you embed a known inductive bias of your system into the neural network it will generalize better. So this is another inductive bias that we put in the neural network. And so we actually observed it to generalize better. Um, and you would expect that if you have data where you know energy is conserved, um, the regular neural network that doesn't have this inductive bias should not generalize as well. Um, so that's also true for like rotational, rotationally invariant CNNs. If you know something's rotationally invariant, and you enforce that, um, it'll generalize better than the regular CNN, which is not rotationally invariant. Very cool. Um, 
Adele is asking if an L uh, Lagrangian neural network can also be applied to a generative adverse neural network uh, for 3D simulation of high energy physics. Uh, for GANs? Yes. Ah. Um, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. Um, I mean, so, so we are generating simulations. But it's not, it's not like, um, yeah, maybe that's an interesting question. So I guess like the generator would just be a, an ODE integrator with the Lagrangian embedded in it. And it would be generating a simulation. And then the, the discriminator would look at the simulation and say if it looks realistic or not. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah that, I don't know. I don't know if it would work, but that's yeah. yeah maybe that's a way of, of uh, like you have data and you want to learn the the physics underlying it, but you don't have that many examples. So maybe you could use like a GAN approach with a Lagrangian, and it generates simulations, and through that you learn the Lagrangian. That's a cool idea. Yeah, actually, there's quite a few physicists who would find that handy in their field of work. Um. This is also could be extended to problems in control theory as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So actually, um, the the deep Lagrangian network paper. Um, so they do it for control theory, and that's why they have things like you can you can actually change the forces. Um, and so their approach, they again they assume a specific kinetic energy. Um, so it's not applicable in astrophysics because the kinetic energy is not uh, mass times velocity. But if you're dealing with like robotics, I think their approach is actually really good for that. Very cool. Yeah. Um, do you they actually they actually use it. Um, it's really cool. They use it for little motors. They use a Lagrangian. Yeah, there's a typical implication of control theory. Um, awesome. Um, and then Alan Young is also asking, do you think Lagrangian neural networks could be applied to rigid bodies where there are also orientations? Uh, rigid bodies of what orientations? Uh, rigid bodies um, that also have orientations. Uh, oh. Oh, like would it learn like the moments of inertia of a rigid body? Yeah, I think it. I think it would. Um, I haven't. I haven't tried that, um, but I would assume if you give it, if you feed as input the orientations, it's like another coordinate. Um, so for Hamiltonian neural networks, that's actually that that's probably really difficult because you don't know what the momenta is. Um, but the Lagrangian neural network, you just feed in um, all the angles of your rigid body um, and it should I think it would work for a rigid body very cool I think that's all the questions that the audience has cool. I'll give yeah, those are great questions um, anything else you want to mention uh, sorry yeah I'll just give it another 30 seconds in case anyone wants oh. to kill us Okay. But asking anything? Thank you. I feel like I feel generally like the I think the Lagrangian graph network, especially applied to grids. So so we apply it to a grid here. Um, I think this will be very useful um, in physics and engineering and maybe chemistry. Um, because you're you're embedding this this energy conservation. Um, into the model, and there's so many different fields where that's important, and it's also very interpretable. So you can use this and kind of pull out the symbolic Lagrangian. You no, know, it's definitely a very impactful paper for sure. Thanks. Um, we don't have any more questions, so I will be wrapping this up. Thank you guys okay. for joining us today, and thank you, Miles, for hosting your talk.
Um, and for the audience, if you would like to see more free content like this, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a like if you enjoyed this session. I'm Rafami, and I hope you have a lovely day. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Cool. And then we wait for Shion to walk us off.